Good morning. Lord gave us a beautiful, cool morning today, did he not? Praise the Lord. Lord. Beautiful. Cool. Yes. Yes. Everybody loves this cool weather. Everybody's been bragging about it and thankful for it. And had uh, had some frost on the top of my outbuilding this morning and my lower field and the lower area kind of comes down into a a valley there and had some some frost in that but yeah so yeah we got a little bit and yeah so I hope that's true yeah <laughs> we haven't had any snow in what several years now that amounted to anything but I hope we'll see some accumulation this year but uh Thank the Lord for the morning he's given us, for y'all coming out and being with us this morning in the Sunday School Hour, uh, being a part of church, and we're going to talk about that this morning, talking about real church, a real purpose. Why are we here? Why did God institute the church? And we're going to see at Acts chapter 2 this morning, uh, Paul and the early apostles and the early starting and beginning, how the church was built and how the Lord added to the church as those as such should be saved so we'll as we open up this morning let's continue to pray for those uh, in our church for brother roby coming up what tuesday i think tuesday is his procedure uh and our uh, procedure may be a light word for it but it's a surgery uh, so continue to pray for him as they as he goes through this uh trial and part of his life that lord has laid upon him and the testimony that uh, he will show forth through this I'm uh, him and Brenda, and for all those that are in need this morning, uh, I think of Josh and Katie's boys, Grayson, Camden, the needs that they had and continue to have, and Grayson going through uh, the issues and the seizures and the medicines and the things that he's uh, dealing with at this time in his life. So continue to pray for them, for Josh and Katie, as they deal with their, their kids and the needs that they have. And pray for our church, for our pastor, the, for the wedding that we'll be having. As you can see, it's kind of decorated a little bit different up here this morning. And that is all for the wedding. It's not for me. So uh, let's pray for that as, as pastor performs the first wedding of the church, I guess, since it's been, I, I mean, there's probably been weddings here in the past, but first church since he's been pastor, here, first wedding uh, since he's been pastor here. So pray for him as he performs that and as he ministers to um, Marshall and Sam as they take their step forward in their life as husband and wife of course they're already already married but there's the ceremonial uh, proceedings that uh, Sam wanted to do she wanted a formal wedding uh, she's a woman she loves stuff like that for me you know just standing before a minister or somebody like that it's kind of all I need I don't really need a lot of this other stuff but women are different <laughs> we can all say amen to that <laughs> so so we all understand that, and we know that, and it was uh, good to be part of it last night as a rehearsal, and uh, I don't necessarily like to go to weddings that much, but I, when, I, when I'm there, it kind of reminds me of the symbolism, the symbolism of weddings, of the marriage, of uh, and the white, and the purity, and all the things that uh, it symbolizes, biblically speaking, as the church, as is the Christ. The wedding, the bride, the purity, and all those things that it uh, it carries forth in our day. Sometimes I just sit back there and just kind of, you know, well up and tears come to my eyes. And but thinking about all the symbolisms, symbolisms of that. But as we open up in prayer this morning, just remember uh, those that can't be here this morning because of sickness, uh, the needs that people have in our congregation and the people around us. Uh, so just open, we'll open up in prayer this morning. Just just remember those. Anything special this morning I need to mention? Yes, brother. Your granddaughter possibly having kidney surgery. Okay. Just pray for that need there. Maggie Reese. Okay. Anything, Josh? Postpone it till November. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
They're, just, they're doing back surgery as far as you know. <laughs> just pray for Miss Anna as she prepares for this. And it's tough to kind of get your mind in focus, I guess. I, I've never had surgery before, so it's, you know, I can't really speak from experience. But I can imagine, uh, like Brother Roby, if they come up, choose to come up and say, well, we're going to postpone it for 30 days, how you kind of, wow, I want to get this over with. And I'm sure it's the same with uh, Miss Anna. But uh, just pray for those uh coming up with surgery and those that are having surgery uh, for their needs. But right, let's open up in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne this morning, we thank you for this opportunity, this time for these people that's made their way out this morning on this beautiful, cool, um, early fall morning. We ask that you would just bless us. Thank you for this church, for these people. For the purpose you have put us here for, I pray that you'd help us to understand it, to apply it to our lives, Lord, and, and be the, uh, the children of God, Lord, that you have desired us to be. I pray for the needs here this morning, uh, for Miss Anna Joyce in preparing for surgery and, and then being postponed, Lord. I pray that you'd help her, strengthen her, Lord, mentally, help her physically, Lord, with this back issue. I pray the doctors will be able to take care of this, Lord. Um, as as they can and for Brother Roby or for Tuesday coming up I pray for him Lord as he goes through this surgery I pray that it would be very successful Lord and he would heal and bring him back um, Lord as soon as possible I thank you for all these you've done today for this church and for these people Father we thank you for all you've done and all you will do in Jesus name Amen Acts chapter 2 this morning. As we know, Acts is a kind of historical book. It gives us the history of the early church. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47. Looking at a, a real purpose. A real purpose. God instituted his church. God put the church here for a purpose and it's to go into all the world and preach the gospel he give the church to his people to his bride to serve its purpose here and let's look in verse 41 through 47 we'll read this and, and go on but chapter 2 verse 41 we'll start there it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. This was the first big message for the church. And we see salvation in verse 41. And they that gladly received his word. The apostles' doctrine, the gospel. And then it says, and they were baptized. Now, the baptism here is not for salvation, but because of salvation. And we'll see that here in just a minute. But, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. You can kind of see just a little bit in verse 42 the means of the church, the working out of the church within our lives. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the teachings, the gospel, the means of the church, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread. Now, some people take this breaking of bread just basically to mean the communion table. As we gather together and remember what Christ had done for us. And some people think it's just the outflow of the fellowship. Of the breaking of bread as we fellowship together at, over at the fellowship hall. Either way. And in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And we know from history and from Acts. 
some of the miracles that were done by the apostles. And, and fear come upon all the souls as they seen this. In verse 44, it says, all, they, all that believed were together. And at all things common. Uh, I, I like all these verses, but 44 is, is, I think, pretty cool. And all that believed, all the members of the church were together. Not just as, not necessary, all together as in one building. But that was true. But they were all together in their mindset, in their hearts, in their focus, in their direction. Because they were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and the teaching. They all didn't ever have different ideas about what the church was supposed to be. They were all together in the mindset of who they were and what it was supposed to be. Now, verse 45, you know, some people take this literally. They did this literally. But not necessary that is for us today. Because he says that they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now this is not a command for us today and it's something that they did in that early church. But it's not necessarily wrong if we wanted to, if Tom wanted to sell some stuff that he had and, and give it to me because I had a need or give it to Mark, whoever, and that's okay. It's what the church does. We take care of each other, whatever means, in every way that we can. All of us don't have a bunch of money in the bank, and so we kind of have some stuff, maybe that we have sitting in the the garage that we don't need, and have Roby's got surgery coming up. He may have a need of some kind, whether it be financial, or like some of the men helping mow the, some of his yards and stuff like that. And we we take part of that, and we help each other if we as we see needs. The church tries to supply that, and that's what they did. And they continue daily with one accord in the temple. In the breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You kind of see from these, these verses the togetherness, the oneness of the early church. Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So it's, it's the Lord that adds to the church. It's the Lord that saves. And he's the one that adds to Calvary Baptist Church as he sees fit. In this lesson, next few weeks, we're going to discover the purpose of the church. And we'll see how the first church at Jerusalem thrived through living out threefold purpose that we see here in these, uh, the scripture. Look at the three are loving God, growing together, and then serving others. That's going to be the three different uh, views that we'll get out of this scripture and see what God desires for us this morning. Now, if you've been in church of any period of time, which I think most of us in here has, church can be one of the most happy places and the most fulfilling places you can go to. And sometimes it can be some of the most irritating places you can be. You can get very irritated with your brothers and sisters in Christ sometimes. And we have to, we have to keep in mind our purpose personally. And not allow anybody to hinder that. We have to keep in mind... Why God has put us here. People view the church with different ideals to its purpose. Some view the church simply as a place to meet friends. And you can do that. It's a place to do business. Some as a place to help with the community needs. And all these things the church does. And some as a place to provide counsel for the family. But all these things I just mentioned are not the only purpose or the reason for the church. What is the biblical purpose for the church? Why did Christ establish his church? And what does he expect us to do through it? As we observe the first church at Jerusalem, we see a threefold purpose here that I just mentioned. And we'll look at those this morning. The first being loving God. Loving God. We exist to love God. 
we gather together and express our love to God, whether it be through the choir, whether it be through congregational, whether it be through uh, the giving process of the church, through the tithes and offerings. The Lord commands us in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. It's a, it's, it's a command that is repeated in the New. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all thy might. And I know sitting in this class this morning or being in this class this morning, that's not the first time we've heard that verse. It probably won't be the last. But that's also repeated in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. He says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy might, or all thy strength is what it says, which can be interpreted might, all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Growing in a heart of relationship with God is the foundation of our walk with God. People may go through the motions of serving God for a variety of motives, but only true love for God will sustain us through a lifelong growth in our relationship with him. I was just talking about, as most of us have been in church for a long period of time, it don't take much sometimes to see people come, see people go. Whatever purposes they go, many times are good reasons. Sometimes they, they find another fellowship they want to be a part of, and that's, that's great. If God needs them over there and God moves them, that's okay. But that's not normally the reason that a lot of people leave. Most people kind of get their feelings hurt. Our former pastor, Roy Grigsby, is passed on now, but he's saying Southern, Southern people are the most sensitive people in the world. He's from up north. He, he ministered up north. He ministered over in Germany and churches over there, and he had a, a great turnover in his church in Germany because they were military. They had a couple years stay, and they, they'd come, and then they'd go. They had purposes for going. They had to go back home or wherever they lived or whatever they were stationed to. But they said, don't take much to knock the chip off a lot of people's shoulder. And they get their feelings hurt and then they're gone. But we have to learn as God's children to be able to deal with people and work with people through their faults and our own faults. Our own problems, our own issues that we all deal with. Just like we deal with our own children sometimes. Sometimes they don't always do what we agree that they should, where they should go, or what they should do. As Brother Leon and Miss Monty's, I'm not saying losing the family, but they're moving to Arizona. And that's tough for children, for a child to move away. Especially when they got grandchildren. <laughs> now, sometimes it's not as hard when just the kids and the wife move away, but, but when they got grandchildren, that's a whole different story, isn't it, Leon? <laughs> yeah, it'd be unreal. I can't imagine having them miss um, Emma and Ellen, Annabelle and Jackson. And by the way, there was a reveal yesterday, if you've seen on Facebook, that Aaron's having a girl, my son, which everybody was not necessarily shocked that it was a girl. But shocked that they were having a child. Because it's always that, no, nah, we're not having children. We're not having no children. And now they're having a child. God always has a different plan sometimes. Never say never. But God may show something different. But praise the Lord for that, Aaron. I'm excited about this. And Aaron got that balloon and stuck it on a target. And he's a big archer. He loves archery. And he went out and shot, it, shot that balloon with an arrow. And it popped, and it was pink. So it was, it was pretty neat. He was, he was a little bit nervous that he would miss the balloon when he shot, but he's a good shot too. So. But we see this loving God starts somewhere. And most of us will probably understand this starts with salvation. Because the unsaved person cannot love God, does not love God, will not love God. That's not their focus, not their desire. That's not what they want. To truly worship God, we must, which is what the gospel is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Scripture, which is what 1 Corinthians says. Salvation provides a tremendous security that can be found in no other relationship. 
our relationship with each other is not why we come to church. We come to church because of our relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 11 and 12 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God's children. When we are saved, we are not only forgiven for our sins, but we are placed into the family of God. We become a son or daughter of God and love him and, and the love that he lavishes on us through salvation is truly life-changing. John chapter 10 goes on to say, in verse 27 and 28 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now who is it that follows God's voice? His sheep. His, sheep, his children. Those who become part of his flock. And his sheep, in verse 28, says, gives, He gives unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. Here in these two verses, we see, we see salvation and we see security in that salvation. It says, And they shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. We are in the hand of our Father as his children. Jonathan Edwards says this, True love begins with God and loves Him for His own sake. Self-love begins with self and loves God in the interest of self. We are prone many times to want to love God so He'll do something for us. But the truth is that through salvation, He has granted us that He loves us and will care for, care for us. We can rest secure in His love. 1 John verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 16 through 19 says this about the love of God. It says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Did you hear that? Because as he is, so are we in this world. You might say, no, we can't love as God loves. No, we can't. But we can love and do the best that we can as we learn from the apostles' doctrine and the teachings of God's word, how we should love each other. Especially those within the household of faith. It's hard many times... To love those outside the walls of the church. Because as, as Pastor said. You know you have those that have. Pink hair. You got purple hair. And you got flaming red hair. These. Especially women. Who want to go to the beautician. And have them do that to their self. It's hard to love. Somebody who gets. Who looks strange. And it's hard to love the. This LBG2 plus community, all the different letters that they add to that, whatever it all means, I don't know. It's foolishness, it's nonsense, but they still need a Savior. They still need to be saved, and this is the purpose of the church. Not to say it's okay, not to lovingly bring them in and say it's okay you just live the way you want to live God loves you that's not the case it's not the case God will judge their sin God will judge them I'm going to say a lot of people say God will judge their sin no God will judge the person for their sin but as we, as we were saying here in verse 17 of that verse says because as he is, so are we in this world. Someone has said that love hath conformed us to him. Because as he was the great lover of God and man, he has taught us in our measure to be so too. And he will not deny his own image. 
So we, as God's children, should love as God loves. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. I think many times as we see the, the strangeness that we see around us in our day, the, the weirdness of people and the foolishness of people, I think we could become fearful. But that perfect love that he's talking about here in 1 John says, cast it out that fear. It should not cause us to fear those that are around us or those that are different than we are. Even though when we do as God commands us and we give the gospel and the Spirit of God works as He does and that person's life is changed, it may take them a while to you know, come in and be part of a church as that young man that Thomas was... They had a couple of them that he brought to church on Wednesday night. It's the first time he'd ever been in church. It's hard to, hard for me to imagine first time being in church. Especially for a young teenager that's probably 17, 18 years old. Maybe 20 years old. I don't know. But imagine the, the life, I guess, or the, the rearing that he's had from whoever his parents are. He's had parents. He's got a mom. He's got a dad somewhere. Don't know his background, don't know where he come from, but I'm about a young teenage man that never been in church before. His family never got him up on Sunday morning and said, oh, we're going to church. Or Wednesday, whatever day it may be. Never been at church. What a strange thing it is for being 20 years old almost and coming to a church and seeing what's going on. That would be different for him. But he ought to have been shown the love of God as he coming to this place not a, an acceptance of sin that might be there and I don't know the man young, you know, probably a fine young man but he needs a savior and that's what the church is for the love of God commences at salvation and it continues with identification. If Christians desire to grow in their relationship with Christ, they must identify with Christ and with His church. Now, there may be people watching this by way of social media. And I'm, I'm extremely glad that we have the social media here that we can minister to those people who maybe can't get out, which is what I think this should be for. People watching YouTube or watching Facebook at home because they're sick. Because there's some reason they can't get out whether you're elderly or sick or um, no, tra no means of transportation, whatever it may be. But it should not be for just people who don't want to get up and come to church. Uh, that is pure tea laziness. It is a lack of love. For God and his purpose for the church. And it's a shame that anybody who has the ability to be able to come to church that don't. For whatever reason. It's letting the devil win. You right? said that right. Yeah. And they're not, as, as Pastor said, not saying that they're not saved. But they're not engaged in New Testament Christianity. Don't forsake, exactly right, in Hebrews. And we'll see that verse here in just a few. But uh, Acts chapter 2, and verse 41, our main scripture says, And they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We see the obedience of these new converts to be added to the local church. These new believers in Acts received the truth of salvation and were eager to make decisions for Christ public through baptism. It says, and they that received the word were baptized. Baptism identifies us with Christ. As the, as the biblical pattern of baptism by immersion presents the death, or represents the death, the burial, and the resurrection. 
Now, most of us have been in church for any amount of time. This is, just, this is just rehashing old things that we already know. But it's good to be reminded what baptism is for. And I think we're not foolish enough to be understand that baptism is for salvation. It's to identify us with Christ as a child of God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Therefore, we are buried with him, this picture of baptism. We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And you see that picture, as Pastor says, buried uh, with Christ, raised again. I don't remember exactly what he says, but raised again in a new life or justification or something like that. But anyway, it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we identify with that through that baptism. We identify with the church. We identify with Christ. It's a picture of being obedient in what Christ commands us to do after salvation. Baptism is an outward picture of what Christ has already done for us. It is a public declaration that we have now chosen to live for Christ. If those who are married love their spouse and want everyone to know it, they wear a ring as a token of their identification with their spouse. We'll see that in the, in the wedding ceremony today. As Pastor explains the meaning of the ring and the symbolism of that. Without the ring, they would still be married. If I take my ring off and set it on the table right here, it doesn't change my marriage. I'm still married. But this shows everybody else that I'm married, that I'm taken for Christ. This is what baptism is, a public identification that you identify with Christ. Without the ring, they would still be married, but the ring is a public statement of love and commitment. Likewise, baptism does not save us, but it does identify us publicly with the Lord and with His church. Those who chose to identify with Christ through baptism and church membership enhance and encourage their growth in the Lord. On the other hand, those who trust Christ but then delay or refuse to get baptized stunt their spiritual growth. This is a form of disobedience to God's command in our spiritual growth as a child of God. After we become a child of God, God's command is to, is to in, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, His command to be baptized. As He tells us and He commands us to go into all the world preaching the gospel, baptizing them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism not only identifies us with Christ, but it also identifies us with the local church. <clears throat> when the newly saved Christian at <clears throat> in Acts 2 were baptized, they were identified with the doctrine of the apostles and the body of believers who had already begun to fellowship there in Jerusalem, the early church. The church at Jerusalem may not have had their own building or their facilities as we have today, but they were definitely a functioning body of believers following the scriptural teaching of the church. The Bible says the new Christians were added unto them. They were added to those who had already been assembling and praying in the upper room, to those who had already had become followers of Jesus Christ. All born-again believers need to be involved in a local New Testament church, where the word of God is preached and where there's opportunity to grow in their love for God. All born again believers, and I repeat that again, all born again believers need to be part of a local church. <clears throat> and again, I'll say, if you're not part of a local church and you're a child of God, you're not practicing New Testament Christianity. You're practicing your own form of Christianity, which is no other form because Christ has told us what it is and how we should practice our Christianity within our society. And he has instituted the church for that. God's instituted the government. and I say a lot of people don't have any problem with the government. I mean, I have a problem with the government. I mean, I'm not disobedient to it. I don't disobey it. I don't agree with it. But I still understand that we're under the the authority of our government.
I don't have a problem with God instituted marriage. God also instituted the church. I don't have a problem with that either. I don't understand why a lot of people do. I don't understand why a lot of people do. But they do. A lot of people out there to call themselves Christians but never come to church. Who never the darken the doors of a church. I think self has a lot to do with that. Self love, worshiping other as pastors had Wednesday night having the uh, series on Ten Commandments is fantastic. I mean if you don't come on Wednesday night start to listen to it. Come and be a part of it. It teaches us a whole lot of what many of those commandments are talking about and it's more of an entirety instead of just knowing there shall have no other gods before me that carries a lot of meaning carries a lot of thought not just the idols that we may worship in our society not saying that we worship idols but there's a lot of things that we we do as God's children worship that we could call an idol but I would encourage you, if you don't come on Wednesday night, please come. Sunday morning, Sunday night, be a part of the local New Testament church. We'll look more into it here in the next week or two. See as we see the early church and what and who and how and why the things that we see that we should be obedient to. It's here for a reason. God's given us his word for a reason and we are to take it and apply it and follow it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I thank you this morning for the church. I thank you for instituting the church, Father. Something that we can be a part of as a child of God. Father, without the church and and Father... A, a, a child of God would be, I think, lost in its purpose here in our in our society and the way our society is, the way uh, <clears throat> people are. Apart from a New Testament church, Father, I pray that you would help us each day to go forward as a member of Calvary Baptist Church and do the work of the ministry. Bring others into the fellowship of this place, Lord, that they can learn and grow and develop as children of God, being part of the body, uh, the bride of Christ. And, Father, as we uh, see this wedding today, thankful for it, Lord, and thankful for the obedience uh, of Sam and Marshall in this. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see the picture of our uh, Savior as our groom. And, Lord, as we as the bride... Help us today, Lord, as we go forward. And Lord, as we hear the message this morning our pastor has for us, I pray that you'd open our hearts and our lives. And Father, as we sing, and Father, as we give, help us give, give as unto you and our love for you and our thankfulness, Lord, for your grace upon us and your mercies on us. In Jesus' name, amen.